Hello and welcome back to the Energy Talk podcast presented by Okra Solar. My name is Olubumi Olajide. On this podcast, we tell stories about the off-grid sector of sub-Saharan Africa, speaking with financiers, policymakers, developers, and everybody in between that is driving towards promoting renewable energy on the continent. I am also pleased to welcome Okra Solar as our new partners for this season of the podcast. Okra Solar is a company that develops mesh grid technology to get energy access to people in off-grid communities. Mesh grids are interconnected solar home systems and are the leading form of electrification that produce high power outputs at low cost. If you would like to learn more about the work Okra Solar is doing, head on to their website at okrasolar.com. Our guest on this episode is David Arinze. If you work in this sector, you might have bumped into one of his posts on LinkedIn, seen him at an energy event, or maybe you know him from his many volunteering activities. David is the Off-Grid Energy Program Officer at Diamond Development Initiative. And my personal experience with David, although we've been connected on LinkedIn for a very long time, the first time we actually met was a year ago in Kigali during the Sustainable Energy for All Forum. He and his wonderful wife, Irene, were hosting a small party. And in the middle of the party, while we're enjoying the food and the good music and the general vibe that he and his wife created, David and I got talking on his balcony about the work he's doing, about the passion and motivations that drive him in the sector, and about how he sees the sector evolving to truly get us closer to the SDG 7 goal and the role that youth and especially Africans play in driving towards that target. In this episode, we'll learn more about David's work and, and about how catalytic financing is driving impact in the off-grid space. So now I'll let David introduce himself and let's get into the conversation if you do find value in this episode, don't forget to subscribe wherever you're listening and recommend the episode to a friend or a colleague. Enjoy. I'm an energy guy, so <laughs> I like to see how I can contribute my quota towards bridging the energy access gap. And I do this through various ways. I work as the program officer of the Energy at Diamond Development Initiatives. I'm also privileged to serve and volunteer on several platforms, working on the policy side, working on the fiscal project implementation side, working also on advisory, so working also on youth, on with youth and inspiring youth to really take meaningful action towards bridging the energy access gap. But yeah, for me, I'm just that guy that is happy to take on the responsibility whenever I call to be able to contribute my quota towards bridging that gap. And you may ask me, okay, why energy? Why the passion? And for me, one, we have a significant gap that exists. I recently saw a report speaking to the fact that over 70% of Nigerians do not have access to electricity. Initially, we used to use the figure of 50%. Yeah. And we're like, over 70%. And when you look at energy access, it's not just that thing that you just say, oh, it's not, it's, it's a miss to an end. It powers agriculture, it powers industries, it powers health, education, you name it. Yeah. So uh, electricity is an enabler, energy is an enabler. And it has a direct link to take people out of poverty because it powers lives and livelihoods. It powers how people make money. It can improve the quality of people's earning by applying your business activities to it. So because of that direct correlation, it has to be able to take people directly out of poverty. For me, it's more than even a passion, right? Yeah. It's, a, it's a call that is way beyond just wanting to have a career path and just do a thing because of, oh, it's a nice career path, but it's more like a mandate or a call to something bigger and much more massive, which would have an overarching impact on the lives of people and also humanity in general. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Could you paint a picture for the audience about where it is you started your career and then you can now end off on what EDI is and what it is you actually do on a day-to-day? -day? This career of mine is one I like to say that it has gone through 
multiple levels of iteration because for so many reasons I say this. I'm a hands-on engineer. I'm a hands-on guy. I, I studied electrical electronics engineering and uh, while I was in school, I was that guy that would fix things. In fact, growing up, I'd be that guy that would tear things apart. But I grew up in Nigeria. I was born here and also experienced the electricity deficit. And so there was a lot of there was more than enough motivation to be able to solve because I wouldn't have studied engineering if, if I didn't want to even solve that problem because I thought it was a technology problem. I'm like, technology? We can bring the invention. We can create something. And, I, and this has always been the understanding that I had while even at my undergraduate days in the university studying my first degree. And so going on from there, I will recall that then I started getting to know about clean energy, renewable energy, solar, and all of that. So even for my final year project, designed an e-trike or an e-vehicle that was mm-hmm. powered by solar. And I was able to come up with a sort of technology that got me a patent from the, that was signed by the president. Oh, so, wow. Yeah, <laughs> so, I was like, so I started just doing that. But again, to be able to understand this problem, because I also believe that you cannot give what you don't. So mm-hmm. to be able to bridge also that knowledge gap, which I also had as a student, I was, an, I was always attending conferences, like power conference is happening, I'm there. And this is me that was happy to sell anything and do anything to raise money to be able to fund myself to conferences yeah. from my university days. And I went to a fantastic school called Covenant University. Yeah. And if anybody that knows Covenant University knows that as a student, you cannot just walk out of the gates because of you are an undergraduate student. You need to take exit. So for every single time, I would take exit and go to these conferences, gain and learn, but it was helping me, it was helping shape my idea on my understanding about the whole space. And yeah, I started the engineering, even before I finished, I also worked in the transition company of Nigeria. I also got involved with the generation side of the system as well, because I intentionally wanted to work across the various value chains. If it's technology, let us understand the technology first, then let us know what the problem is. Yeah. So worked in generation, worked in transmission, worked a bit in distribution as well, even post university experience. All of that happened. Did a bit of consultancy with some incredible companies and, and firms before I found myself in the before I just iterated into the clean energy space, but still as an engineer, more like how do I solve this thing from a technical engineering background? Because this, I feel like it's a technology background, but the technology issue. But again, I began to evolve where in the course of my experiences, beyond just being in the switch yard or being in the field, I started understanding things around project management, that beyond just having to screw things and install a transformer or a circuit breaker, close and open uh, circuit breakers, carry out turnaround maintenance for equipments in the switcher or install, help install transmission lines, high voltage transmission lines and maintain them as well. The sector is beyond all of this. As an engineer, you're a part of an ecosystem where there are financiers, where there are several planners, you name it. And so that is how I started growing and really building that knowledge that I would say that he also significantly helped me even when I started playing in the clean energy space because yeah. I also worked in a company where I was the lead solar engineer. There was a time we did bids with AFDB and a couple other guys, still as on-ground engineer, right? Yeah. But of course, as I grew across the ranks, working with other junior engineers and other professionals and getting much more exposure there was a bit of project management there was now financing there was now like okay if we're going to do a project like this what would the cost be how do we need to how would we execute it so that whole beginning to end experience for me was uh, that came on the scene and so started honing it from there and yeah it contributed to what my role was what my role now became at organization di because Diamond Development Initiatives are also implementing partners for the United States African Development Foundation in Nigeria. So all the work that I do through the clean energy portfolio is literally on behalf of USADF. Or we, we are monitoring those projects, implementing those projects, ensuring that the successful implementation from project concept or yeah. proposal to 
final project delivery and objectives are being achieved, it's our responsibility to work with the developers that are funded to achieve that. Yeah. So, so yeah. how closely do you actually end up working with the developers? Because I understand most of the projects tend to be off-grid projects. So how closely are you working with developers? Are you kind of like on their side or is it kind of like you're reporting on behalf of USAID? So how does that dynamic work so you manage those relationships? Uh, because the relationship is quite dynamic. Dynamic mm. in the sense that you're on the ground with the developers every other day. You're literally in the same communities that developers are working on. Yeah. You're literally going to go through all those interesting terrain. I don't want to bother you with the details of some of how rural and off-grade communities can be. But they're literally there with the developers understanding their challenges because at the end of the day, the success of the project is your success. And so you're working closely with them to ensure that all the challenges that need to be surmounted are surmounted. Because sometimes, as the project is onboarded, you begin to see that there are certain challenges, maybe even with the community that may rise up and you just need to be able to educate them better. You need to work with them and ensure that they ha you have their buy-in to be able to ensure that the project is successful. Because these projects that have been deployed as well are businesses. Yeah. And they are uh, they, uh, implemented by business entities who must get their return in investment. But for us, we're literally hand-holding, working all the way to ensure that this project is successfully delivered. But of course, again, as implementing partners for ADF as well, we are reporting to ADF on the status of projects, how things are advancing, if there are any challenges, we communicate. If there are ways that we could also better approach things with the project, we also make those recommendations. But it's just more like being the eyes and ears and foot of the various development partners we work with. And again, as ADS partners, we also work with several organizations. And I want to use this opportunity to say this, because about our organization, because we're like, okay, what do you guys do really? Yeah. You know, and what we do as an organization, we're development service providers. We literally help donors or, or support the successful implementation of projects and programs that donors are trying to implement in the country. So it may be agriculture-focused project or off-grid energy-focused project or youth entrepreneurship-focused project. We are there. We are there to also support the design as well, even come up with budgeting. Okay, why do we think you should spend this? What should the budget look like for a program of this magnitude that has this objective that needs to be achieved within this timeline? Yeah. So all of those sort of things, because of our underground experience, we can help co-design that that is the part of the support and services that we provide yeah i think it's fair to say that for many of the developers working in this space financing seems to be a very common like thread mm -hmm. of should i say pain point that everybody shares and there might be a bit of perception that when it comes to donors like usaid usadf that the money they give because most of the time is in terms of grants that's essentially free money but I know that doesn't like fit into reality. What do donors like that actually look like when they're looking at bringing money into projects and looking at off-grid in South Africa? What metrics are they really important? Because they may not necessarily be interested in returns, but what key metrics do they, to actually drive them to invest further into the ecosystem? For us as an organization, we want to be able to improve the lives of livelihood of people in deprived climes across the country. Yeah. And... We see a lot of synergy with our mission as an organization with that of other partners as well. For example, ADF, any day, any time, the mission of ADF is to create pathways for prosperity on the South Climbs. Yeah. And what ADF stands for and what we also stand for, there's that synergy in terms of at the core, we're trying to improve lives and livelihoods. Again, when you have that mission statement, the question is, you can't help everybody. Yeah. But what are the specific sectors that you're targeting and what are the indicators you're trying to achieve? So when we look at some of those goals and some of those plans, we begin to advise and say, we'll look at connections and we'll look at the combination of what seems to be achieved. And again, you look at it, there's no community that you go into, rural community, no matter how rural they are, that there's not some sort of business activity happening. Okay, so is that the kind of development story that donors like primarily are looking for right now? They're looking for like productive use, they're looking for stories where there's scalability with the energy that's being provided. Is that, is that the narrative that they're currently looking for when you're putting together reports and working on, pro on the program designs? 
Most of the time, I would say that for donors, they're looking for social return on investment. Okay. And they want to see lives improve. They want to see communities grow. They want to see that the people are living better lives. Yeah. And by living better lives, it's dependent on so many things. And like I earlier mentioned, one person cannot solve the whole problem because again, these are donor agencies, this is not your government. So they are just contributing towards bridging a gap because most of the time you hear, okay, wh- why are there interventions around electricity? Mm-hmm. Why are we even trying to solve the electricity problem? Why? But because of there is a current gap that we have seen that reports have even showed us that currently exists, not just in Nigeria, but also in Sub-Saharan Africa and even the world. Yeah. You pick up, de- depending on the subject you pick up, the electricity is there, there are even different issues around value chain. But because of at the core of these issues, lives and livelihoods of people are at the receiving end. And if they are able, they, they want to solve this problem, or if they want to even contribute their quota towards trying to solve this problem, then they must take action. But again, to one bit of the thing that you said, which I also like to correct, yeah. is people seeing grant money or donor funding as free money. Yeah. I don't think that is correct because, yes, the donors may not be expecting a financial return in investment, but you should see it as catalytic capital. Let's put a picture here. Bumi, you are a young entrepreneur in Nigeria doing your thing. You even have a team of volunteers who are working with you to be able to... Maybe you even develop solar home systems. Yeah. And you've put in some level of design thinking into it. You have a fantastic product. Maybe you even close the grant to be able to turn the idea to product. Yeah. Because I'm sure that you'll not just take a nice smile to the manufacturer and say, guys, please, uh, <laughs> I, I mean, see my 32. Help me turn this to, so, so, to a product. So you, you need to turn that idea into a product that may go through different levels of iteration. Yeah. Now, you have the fantastic product. Friends and family have not whined you. They have told you the truth that this is a fantastic product. Maybe you have an uncle that is even using it in another in a village. Say, ah, maybe every time you call him, the person is always praying for you. Like, this is a very good thing. And you ask yourself, I have something here because this is actually being able to meet a need. Yeah. And because of you have the product, you already have manufacturing on lockdown. Today, if you tell a manufacturer, hey, give me a thousand units. They are able to do it for you and you just need to pay. Yeah. Now, you don't have the money to pay. And you now have some sort of, maybe there's a program by a donor and it gives you an opportunity to access $200,000. And maybe all you needed to be able to at least fund 1,500 units was about maybe $1,500, $150,000. And you had to spend on... And that means it also includes importation. But yeah. again, if you're going to be doing business, you need to be able to have some, you have some operational costs that you need to cover. Now, the donor has been able to give you that. It's supporting you as an entity. Let's call it Boomilite. <laughs> and that's your product. And yeah. with Boomilite, Boomilite is literally targeted at the last of the last, the end mile. The last mile farmers on the, that literally are in the rural communities, people who need access, energy to access to carry out some bit of both residential and a bit of also productive use, like maybe lighting up their shops and all of those sort of things, may not be able to afford it or may not even have the access to it. Yeah. But now, this funder has given you this money. You're able to more bankroll you. Yeah. And you're able to get this thing up of course, with your team of aggressive volunteers, you got guerrilla marketing. <laughs> yeah. In six months, all one five units are out. And you now have a structure where you have, you're documenting how your money is coming in. Though it's in trickles, but every 1,500 user is paying you a, part, a, a particular amount and it's consistent. But maybe that is enough springboard for you to even approach an investor. Yeah. A patient capital investor who will say, you know what? But I see your numbers and I think that I'm going to take an initial bet. Looking at what we see, maybe you're giving your customer six months to pay. This money is not going back to the donor. Yeah. When they pay back for the product, it's coming to Boomilite account. And now Boomilite says, okay, with this, we can plunge this money back in and get more products. And now an investor is saying that, okay, 
Boomilite, looking at also, don't forget the fact that you also included your profit. So maybe yeah. you had planned that you're going to spend 150k excluding operations, but out of that 200 dollar uh, k dollar investment, we're able to get back 230 or 240 or 250. Yeah, now the money did not just come in lump sum, just like how you would have received it, but guess what? You've gotten a customer base of 1,500 plus people. You've gotten even access to other information that you usually would not get into. You've got into an idea of into their spending patterns and even how they make money. Some of them will tell you, oh, Oga, see, I farm yam. Instead of me to, you, you to pay me, uh, for me to pay you cash, let me give you yam instead. And you can even create a market <laughs> around I'm telling you, yeah. these, these things happen. It's just that it boils down to the lens from which you are seeing it. But guess what? The money that has been injected into your company, call it grant, has just been catalytic capital that has put you out there. Yeah. Now, what you choose to do with it would determine if you make or mar your business. Because that is enough. Of course, taking, a, taking into cognizance several economic activities and several factors, that is enough for you to keep on running your business. And that same thing with grant capital or catalytic capital, like I like to call it. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, it depends on the lens for which you're seeing things. Nobody wants to flush his money down the toilet. And you shouldn't see that grant capital is one type of financing that should be flushed down the toilet <laughs> because it's also an investment. Yeah. Though it may not have financial returns on, on, on investment implication, but it is also enough to put you where you wouldn't have ordinarily put yourself within that short time. Yeah. And I'm actually curious from the work you've done so far and developers you've worked with, do you have any like particular story you like to turn to as this oh, is a good example of yeah. when the donor funded approach actually makes a significant impact in operations and the impact in the communities being served? I won't be biased to anybody. Yeah. So what I'll tell you is on the website on our social media, we are, ha we are always, if I were in the business of story, Telling, yeah. telling the world incredible work that is happening. Go check us out at DI Nigeria on all social media platforms. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, we're there. LinkedIn as well. Yeah. And also for some of our partners that we've worked with, for example, like USADF, it's always on their website. Mm -hmm. Check in. These companies are not under the rock. <laughs> they are literally on public domain. This information is out there. But I will tell you, we have seen some really comforting and exciting stories. Honestly, I'm happy to do this again and again. <laughs> Why? Because the kind of impact I have seen happen in, short a, in such a f short time through businesses that are willing to step on the gas is mind-blowing. Honestly, at the end of the day, the level of success is highly dependent on the level of resilience that is put into it. There will be challenges. In fact, I don't want to sound like, oh, it's always very rosy, it's very easy. <laughs> <laughs> and anybody that has done business in Nigeria will tell you that it's not easy being an entrepreneur in Nigeria. Yeah. But even with all of those experiences and situations, you still see that companies are doing amazing. Not just any on the financial side, but also on the impact side. I don't think you, would, you can do good work and not get impact at the end of the day or do impactful work and not get financial returns in, at the end of the day. Yeah. I don't think so because no matter what you want to call a social intervention, oh, energy, because energy is not a social intervention. It's a business I must be paid for. Yeah. You never go to the, to the filling station and say, oh, I just need to put a gas, uh, put some fuel in my car and just move around. Yeah. If you like, don't pay. <laughs> they will close the gate. And if you're not careful, they will arrest you and they will impound your vehicle. So that is the kind of attitude we also need to, because electricity is not a social intervention. Yeah. It is a service that must be paid for. Yeah. And so looking at what the impact it provides or the impact associated with it is now what we need to look at. For example, think about it, Bumi. Someone would farm rice, for example, mm. and the bag of paddy, at, if you're selling it just from the farm, it's 
say, one X in value. And that same bag, you take it, and guess what? Take, for instance, that's maybe a farmer farmed a, a hectare of land. Got, say, 30 tons. Yeah. From a hectare. If you want to do the math, I, I don't want to bother you all of that. But if you do the math, you see that, let's call the value 1x. That same 30 tons, he had to wait a couple months, about three months or even four months. I even hear some species even take five months hmm. before the harvest. And you have an agro miller chilling. And that agro milling component runs this your 30 tons in one week and increases the value by 3x. In some cases, 4x. What you had to wait three months to harvest. Yeah. Just by the value addition element of electricity, agro milling component increases that value. And now you tell me, that is what it means for electricity to be improving lives and livelihoods. Why? Because that chairman, that farmer that is farming that rice can yeah. earn more than selling it off at party if he can add much more value to it. And now think about it when you now begin to sell when the product is even scarce. Because there are also those sort of dynamic storage around it. So the learning, the impact is huge. But we just look at, oh, electricity, oh, is this, it looks like a commodity that we should not pay for. Oh, we just want to run through life and feel that every other thing we can pay for it by electricity. No, that's not the case. Because it, at the end of the day, it's an enabler. Yeah, and yeah, it so is. it should be treated with mm. that level of seriousness. Yeah, okay. Let's imagine there is a developer from Bumi Light who is listening to this episode right now. Yeah. And they are curious. They are like, okay, if I look at some USADF projects or programs and I think they are related to what I'm doing, what kind of supports does it look like coming from DDI once they are in that implementation stage operationally? Because a lot of them, I think developers that are running to fall into diff different categories, either they are purely technical or they are financial services firms disguising as developers, which is a completely <laughs> different <laughs> conversation we don't have to get into here. Oh, so what kind of support do you typically give developers? What frequent challenges do you see many of them fall into? Because a funny anecdote, one of the projects I heard about was having problems where rats were eating cables. So the <laughs> I know the challenges can be very broad, but have you seen any that prop up? Have you seen any like any points where they need support more just from the amount of work you've done and the organizations you've assisted so far? Honestly, I don't even need to get to the conversation of companies that were supported so far. Yeah. Uh, we've even gotten from our due diligence process. When we engage with companies, try to understand what they're trying to achieve. Because for us, it's a, we try to look at it from a 360 approach. On the technological side, we are able to advise on the hands-on technology and engineering side of things. On the finance side, we are able to also give you a lot of guidance to that as well. In fact, there's no project that we would uh, that would end up being funded without a level of uh, a significant level of financial modeling attached to it or financial sort of analysis done. No projects would even scale without that. But for us we look at it like we like to say this in the terms of the entirety of hand holding. Whatever hand holding represents is what we try to, even we, what we try to give, even where we say connecting you to certain, certain platforms that you may not have been to, certain individuals, maybe you're even trying to reach out to a particular financial institution because for us, it's not just funding a project. We know that it's not just one funding is enough to be able to help you scale. Yeah. So you need to just stay at it. Whatever it is you're receiving finance to do, do it well and be ensure that it is done in the financially viable manner so that you can close further financing and anybody that sees your financial books can say okay you are actually in business yeah but also a very critical component for us is also the support to follow on financing so every other time we are also behind the scenes speaking with various financiers on behalf of our grantees also seeing how best they can be better supported beyond whatever initial capital that they have received. We've had testimonials from people say, oh, even at when we were, when we engaged with them during due diligence stage, they really saw that there are a couple of gaps that they wanted that they had not bridged as a result of that process. And you know what? 
we'll come back again after this cycle because clearly we are not ready. And, and so some are like, oh, we're not ready, but f- learnings from what we, from, from the feedback we got and from what we saw, even ourselves, we're able to close financing from other institutions. Mm-hmm. So for me and for us, that's really exciting to hear. That's really exciting to see. So I would say that it's a 360 degree support. But again, when it comes to support, especially when a project is being implemented, while you are looking at several indicators to ensure that the project is on track, sometimes you have companies that would come and mention, oh, there's this sort of support that I would need and I would like, we believe that you can facilitate it. And of course, when it's within our jurisdiction, (laughs) support is what we leave, support is what we breathe. So whatever it is, because for us at the end of the day, we want to be able to ensure that these companies are able to not just implement projects, but to run successful, financially viable and bankable clean energy businesses. Because once that is done, they're doing running businesses rightly. These businesses are creating significant impact on the ground, creating jobs, improving lives and livelihoods, enabling lives and livelihood, enabling sectors. So the impact is far reaching. And so for us, we're committed to that sort of support because your success is literally ours. We're happy to say, oh, Boomi Light is a company that we worked with and we funded their first project. We were able to support them to be able to do their first project, but now they, they're a multi-billion dollar company. Yeah. I mean, and Boomi Light say, hey, if you want to do anything, go and speak to those guys at DIO because literally they seem to know what you need to know to have all your needs met, quote and unquote. Yeah. You know, but for, yeah, that's it. Okay. So anyone listening, feel free to steal the business model that David just gave for Boomi Light. <laughs> so let's say someone is listening, they want to steal the business model you've clearly laid out. What are some of the programs that you work with different donor organizations that are more entry level? What are the ones that are more intermediate? What does progression look like when you're first entering the world of catalytic capital? And are there ones like pitfalls during application for developers who maybe come from a very technical background and are not very used to the financial parts, doing their models, making it look good, like doing the reporting that needs to be done? So it's like, what does that progression look like when entering this world? To answer this question, Bubi, a couple weeks back, we had a podcast. Yeah. Or more like a webinar, not even a podcast, at DI. Yeah. Know, and I implore you to go to our YouTube page and find it out. It was titled, What Are Donors Looking For? Yeah. So, <laughs> very, very to the point. Title. It was titled, What Are Donors Looking For? Yeah. To fund SMEs, mm-hmm. MSMEs. On that podcast, you would find a lot of gems that I don't need to really repeat and talk about. But again, you're aware... With ADF, there's an upgrade energy challenge that is running with several partners we've worked with as well. There are meaningful contributions that are happening towards the sector. We have all of this in the public domain, and we're happy to connect some more if you have additional questions. But we have identified this as an organization that people need to be able to know more. Because if you know what to avoid, you would be able to, to do things differently. Yeah. And so that's why I would just say that we have already answered this question in, in its entirety. Mm-hmm. There were Q&As. And the beautiful thing is, even if you're listening to this podcast and you're not an energy guy and you just want to run a business or you think you have something phenomenal that you need some level of catalytic capital to, to close, that webinar is for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that will definitely be in the show notes of this episode while it goes out. And I know you've already spoken in at length about what you enjoy about your role and all of that. But I want to ask, with the donor organizations you're talking to, with the developers you're working directly with, let's say by 2030, looking at the SDGs 7 goal, how would you define failure? What do you think would need to happen for it? To, okay, you know what? With, despite all the work in this sector, like we are still falling behind targets, what would that scenario look like for you? This question is quite an interesting one. Yeah. And I have a lot of nostalgia trying to answer this question for so many reasons. The UN High Level Political Forum just ended in New York, and I was privileged to, to be the lead discussant for the session that was focused on SDG 7, and its interlinkages with other SDGs. This year as well, SDG 7 is under review by the UN. Every four years, coincidentally this year, the last time it was reviewed was 2018. And the next time it fell on, in, in, it fell in, in 2000 and, 
and, and three here this year. And so we had the review and there was a lot of global stock take. Where are we? What's the progress that has been made? And data, anyone that listened to my speech is also in the public domain as well. Anyone that listened to my speech and other comments by incredible professionals like the CEO of SE for All, Mrs. Damlola Ogumbi, and even other people who spoke during the G7 Progress Report when it was launched, you will see that data shows that we are not on track. But that data also shows that we've made some progress. Yeah. And what I like to answer this question, looking at from a local context or from a more African, sub-Saharan, African-specific context, why am I looking at it from that context? Because that is also where we have the most of this gap. And I would say that come 2030, I believe that would have made some good progress. Why data already shows us we are not on track. So we don't even need to ask ourselves whether data already says if we continue at this rate, we would not achieve SDG 7 by 2030. I'm not going to contribute to what data has already said. However, what actions do we need to take going forward? We need to triple financing into this space, both in Nigeria and also in Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And how can we really triple financing? Before I go into that, I also want to be able to talk about, I want to quickly talk about the role of equipment manufacturing in all of this. You typically want to do a project today. Any massive project you are doing in the country today, equipments are being imported. Yeah. Panels, batteries, inverters, you name it. Now the question is, it's even quite interesting that for certain installations that need to happen, we need to fly in professionals hmm. to the country. So clearly, how do we want to meet a goal that we have a capacity gap, yeah. have a supply chain gap, have an equipment manufacturing gap, have a talent gap, and we really want to achieve that goal by a set period. Now you will be tell me. With all of this that I've said, clearly these gaps need to be filled. Yeah. We cannot afford to be able to meet, even when we want to talk about the grid, transformers, circuit breakers, even transmission cables, imported. Meanwhile, we have the natural resources to be able to lock down this production in country and in continent. So we need to begin to think more from the production side of things that, hey, we cannot just continue to consume. We keep on saying, oh, we're having FX issues today, FX. Trust me, if you have a fantastic product, there are people who have products that are exported from Africa to Europe. People pay for value. Yeah. So when there is value, you will be able to meet your immediate needs. And even out of the excess of meeting your immediate needs, you serve the world. Because at the end of the day, it's a business. So towards 2030 and even beyond, we need to be able to think critically around manufacturing. We need to think about how we can really address the talent issue. Current today, the Council for the Regulation of Engineering in Nigeria set up National Clean Energy Scheme with the core focus to ensure that we sanitize the talent space within the clean energy technicians ecosystem so that people who are actually carrying out installations are certified to carry out these installations. Of course, with support from incredible organizations like GIZ through the Nigeria Electricity Support Program and other partners, that was able to contribute significantly to the space. Yeah. Empowering local training centers across the country that are led by Nigerians, run by Nigerians. Having Nigerians also participate in these trainings 
Why? Because if we do not really bridge this talent gap, somebody will just come up and say, put a signboard, are they do solar? <laughs> and <laughs> just in case you did not understand my phrase, I, I am a solar professional or I can help you with your solar installation. And the person comes and says, I did do solar. And you engage this individual, it may be a male, maybe a female, but the quality of work that you need to be done is not done. Because if it is not installed rightly, it can lead to fire outbreaks. So that was the reason behind ensuring that we only have certified talent playing within the space. So if you also want to play within that space, you need to be trained through a standardized curriculum and certified. Then you're also engaged and being monitored as well. It's not that you're just allowed to loaf around so that one can, and even after a while, there'll be much more assessment on you so that you can learn something and forget it. But mm. once there's that constant assessment that you're committed to a life of continuous capacity building. Yeah. And that's the, that's the, the thinking behind it. Back to my point around, because I was talking about talent, I was also mm -hmm. talking about equipment manufacturing. We need to really look at these spaces, not from a place of sentiment, but from a place of a business. The market currently exists. Ensure that there are policies that address the infilt in infiltration of fake or substandard equipment into our countries and into our franchise area. Because today you go into the market, sometimes you say, oh, I'm buying a 300-watt panel or 450-watt panel. And when you test it, that thing that you had there is just a label because it's less than half. Hmm. Even under standard testing condition, STC, it's less than half of whatever they have written there as the rated capacity or rated power. So, how did this get into our country in the first place? How did it get into our marketplace in the first place? And because of sometimes there is some level of knowledge gap that exists, people just go in, oh, and they do solar. I go and buy the equipment. You buy the equipment, you install it, and the customer says, oh, my system keeps on tripping off. Or it's not even working because of substandard, substandard product or yeah. even poorly designed systems so these are because when a system works well it serves as a testimonial to others to get on it because it has proven that it works and so it's important that we also speak about these things because while people may also want to get into the space of manufacturing mm -hmm. we need to have strong laws that ensure that it's not every Tom, Dick, and Harry that can just bring in anything into the country and then find its way to our marketplace. Yeah. Because whether we like it or not, that would also compete with those who are doing incredible, solid products who may also put a premium on it. Because again, it's a business. Thank you for listening to the podcast. And since you've already made it to the end, you might as well subscribe to make sure you don't miss the next episode on the Energy Talk. I'm truly excited to be working on this brand new season and we have an amazing lineup of guests coming up that I can't wait to introduce to all of you. So don't forget to share with a friend or colleague and I hope you all have an amazing rest of your week and see you next time. Bye-bye for now.